Awesome. Um, Johnny Damon, everybody, the legend, my favorite Red Sox player of all time. Go. Um, hey, thanks so much for taking the time, man. This is unreal. I know it's pretty crazy, so thank you again. Yeah, you're welcome, man. I know you're saying that because I'm here, and I apologize for going to New York, but the you know, That's tough. We're going to get to that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I mean, okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that later. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Johnny, uh, maybe uh, talk about, you know, how you got started um, growing a passion for the game of baseball. Um, you know, take us through that. Yeah, well, when I was six years old, I started playing t-ball, and I was pretty good. Every time I hit the ball, I would just keep on running and score a lot of um, – home runs. There could have been a couple errors in there, but I was doing very well. The next year I was playing with the older kids who were 12, uh, up to 12. So my brother was on that team. So I held my own. I hit 305 as a, I think I just turned eight with those guys. So I continued playing, obviously watching some baseball games. They weren't on all the time. Being from, um, born in Fort Riley, Kansas, the Kansas City Royals were my team and watching George Brett hoist a World Series championship. I said, this is what I want to do. And also growing up, we had some college games on TV. So I got to see Tino Martinez play and hit over 400 at um, the University of Tampa. Um, it could be Tampa University, so I apologize. But um, just seeing that sweet swing and I was like, Oh, I can't, can't wait to go play in college. And I, I just, I had size. I mean, when I was 13, I was 6'1", 180 pounds. And I mean, I did my push-ups. I ran a lot. Um, I did my dips. So I stayed strong, um, stayed out of trouble. And, you know, baseball came very naturally to me. My arm was actually a rocket back then, but a little football injury, um, landing on the football when I was running. I, I, I was scared to th um, let, let it loose and throw it hard for a long time. So I always knew to hit the cut, cut, uh, cut off, man. And, you know, it, it worked out. I, I was able to learn how to get to the balls faster with a quick release. And uh, so I got by with a not so great arm in the big leagues. Hey, man, it worked out well for you, man. It paid off. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so in high school, yeah, you mentioned how you played football. Did you uh, – I, I saw you went to the same high school as Warren Sapp too, right? Like, uh, No, uh, rival high schools. Oh, okay, rival high school. Okay, yeah, because yeah. I, saw, I saw that connection. Um, you know, so, you know, was that a tough balance? You know, I know you had the injury, but like, were you thinking about base, going pro baseball at that time, playing – some football as well, or did you always have that vision? Or? Um, yeah, I was pretty good at football, but I didn't love football. I also was pretty good at soccer, but there was no place to go and play soccer because um, the MLS wasn't around, and also going to Europe during the uh, um, the wars that were going on, I just really didn't think about it, and my passion was baseball. Warren Sapp made sure that I didn't love football. You know, he was an All-American tight end. I was playing free safety. Um, we banged heads, and it didn't feel too good. So I, I knew football wasn't my calling. Uh, we started having year-round baseball and just stuck to it and just kept on improving. And, you know, I was um, very fast. I, I was going to run – indoor track at the University of Florida. And I was close to um, Olympic speed. I mean, I came in fifth in the 100 in the state of Florida. I came in second in the 200. Never lost the 400-meter race. So, um, yeah, I was pretty fast for yeah. a big guy, too, you know. Yeah, absolutely, man. You're a beast, a beast. Um, yeah. yeah, a lot of people don't realize how big I am. You know, they, they look at me, they're like, oh, I thought you were a tiny leadoff hitter. I was like, <laughs> so what are you going to do about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that, that's crazy, man. I mean, what was, you know, obviously, you know, you had that athletic gene. Um, were your friends and family, you know, supportive about you, 
you know, pursuing, you know, baseball, um, you know, where some people like, oh, you should do track. I mean, take us through that because then you got drafted by the Royals in 95. So, I mean, take us through, you know, that time and that transition. Yeah, well, I knew track was going to be a tough go. I was a tad bit slower than the tops in the world. And when you're a tad bit slower, you're not going to make it. And the traveling and not much pay and like baseball, I knew if I made it, I could take care of my family for a long time. I, um, the number one thing my parents wanted was for me to get a college scholarship. And I was able to get um, a full ride to the University of Florida. And, you know, when the Kansas City Royals drafted me, uh, we didn't come from much. My parents' bills were racking up. Uh, my parents didn't even know that I was really good at baseball until our phone kept ringing off the hook with all these scouts. And my dad hated the phone ringing because they, they worked um, two jobs day and nights. So whenever the phone rang, he always went, hello, nah, baseball scout, hang up. So I'm like, oh. my brother had to tell him, dad, Johnny's pretty good. Like there's a good chance he can uh, get a scholarship and uh, make some money playing this game. So my dad was kind of taken back and he's like, huh, okay, let's, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> yeah, geez, just hang up like that. Damn, that's tough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's yeah but my dad always said, um, I'm not here unless the president of the United States calls and he needs me to go back and fight for our country. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. geez, man, I mean, that, that respect. I mean, you know, that, that seems like a crazy time um, for, you, yeah. for you and your family, for sure. Well, it, it was. And also, I struggled my senior year. I, I was in a track meet at the, um, at the University of Florida, um, got some food poisoning, and I went from 185 pounds down to 170. So I was pretty weak, um, swinging the bat, struggled. And every time I hit the ball hard, um, you know, I broke a guy's uh, um, ribs because I hit it so hard. It got ruled an error. Um, guys kept making diving plays on me, plays at the wall. And so my senior year, I only hit 305. And Everybody thought I was going to go to number one, and, you know, I struggled. So I slipped down to number 35, and that's another reason why I wanted to sign because I had a lot to prove. And plus, our Metro Conference here in Orlando, Florida, we have a lot of great talent. So all these high schools here have a chance to beat some colleges. And my high school team was so good that everybody either got signed or they – got a college scholarship so we we were ballers so I I knew I was definitely ready yeah no absolutely I mean that must be tough though when you're in college bouncing all those sports right like you know, track and then I mean just track and baseball right like one sport yeah. probably like you're probably beat after like just one yeah. sport, you know season like balancing you know both those I mean that that can't be easy no, no uh, fortunately, I had great coaches, but I, I feel for these kids now who um, couldn't finish up their senior year and uh, may not even be able to start up their freshman year in college. Um, I think we're, we're close to being able to do so. Uh, I know they're talking about there's a little spike in Florida, but the numbers are so inflated here. Like most people, um, like some, it's hitting some people very hard, um, but most people who are testing positive they're testing positive five times trying to get back to work because they have bills to pay. So they, those five positive tests count as five people. And so the numbers are very inflated and are going to stay inflated because people need to work, need to make money. And um, so, and also a lot of the people who are getting it, they say they feel sick for a couple hours, possibly a day. They take the medicine and, uh, they feel a little tired and they're, they're fine within two days. Uh, most people and uh, at least like our age or younger. And, and we know if you're older, you're more susceptible to um, get sick. And we knew as little kids that if we uh, were sick, we don't go anywhere, you know? So I'm kind of like, 
now we're being told when we're sick, don't go anywhere. We, we knew that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's definitely a crazy time for sure. I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to make the most of it, right? So, um, yeah. Yeah, like, like with the baseball games, I would like to see high school and college players who didn't get drafted this year to be able to go watch social distance. I mean, there are only five rounds this year. So mm -hmm. imagine how many talented ball players were drafted after the fifth round and may not get a chance if we were um, had this going on back in our day. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that, that's one thing I wanted to chat with you about is, you know, when, when you got drafted by the Royal um, in 1995, you know, talk about like that transition as a young kid, um, you know, transitioning from college to professional. And then, you know, you, you know, those first few years in the MLB yeah. for you, right. Whether it's Royals. Um, right. I mean, talk about that. Okay. Well, I was drafted in 92 and I signed and turned pro with the Kansas city Royals. Unfortunately for me, spring training was only 30 minutes away at boardwalk and baseball. So I stayed in the dorm for a week and then I knew that I could just drive back and forth. It'd be a lot easier. I mean, the dorms, um, you really can't do much. You were pretty much locked in after nine o'clock and, um, me still being at home, I um, just wanted to live and see my parents and all that good stuff. So it wasn't a difficult first year for me. And and then the next year I went off to uh, Rockford, Illinois. Um, this is 93, played pretty well. Then I went to Wilmington, Delaware in 94. Our team won um, 100 games and lost 44, won the championship. That was my second championship in uh, the minor leagues, the Gulf Coast team, and then um, Wilmington. And then I went to Wichita, Kansas, and, you know, I tore that league up. And I tore it up so well that they told me I was going to the big leagues from double-A. And, you know, I never went back to triple-A after I got to the big leagues. So I, uh, you know. That's pretty special. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what was going on through your head, right? Like when they called you up, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Well, the crazy thing is, I had a day off two days prior, and then um, off again. And we were in Midland, Texas. Ron Johnson's our manager, and I'm like, I'm mad because I want to get out there. I want to keep on like pushing for the MVP and all that stuff. And Ron Johnson stops and talks to the club. It's like, Johnny is upset. I mean, this guy never plays. This guy never plays. And you're complaining that you aren't playing. And I'm like, I just want to know why. <laughs> so he's calling me out. Um, and he said, okay, the reason why you're not playing is because you're going to Kansas City. And I was like, for what? <laughs> because now I'm jumping over the center fielder in AAA. And he goes, you're going to the show. You're going to the big leagues. And, and I was like, oh, wow. 21 years old. And I, you know, I thought I was going to um, play a year in AAA and get to the big leagues at 23. And they're like, nope, you're ready. Go ahead. You'll be starting in uh, center field tomorrow night. And I was like, whoa. So, of course, we don't have cell phones yet. <laughs> so, I'm starting to call everybody and tell them nobody's picking up the phone. And, um, like, I'm paying, like, $5 from the hotel phone to try to reach out to people. And um, $5 each. And nobody's picking up. So, um, get on a flight back to Wichita, load up the car grab the dog and uh, head up to Kansas City. So uh, that was very stressful, but um, very uh, re rewarding. Yeah, I know, absolutely. I was gonna say like, that must've been super overwhelming for you, right? At 21. Oh, oh absolutely. And I would have been a junior in college at the time and instead I'm playing in the big leagues and that's what's, uh, that's what's uh, special. And, 
you know, and if I would have gone to college, who knows? I, maybe I get hurt. Maybe I do something stupid with some stupid friends. And so um, the big leagues ended up, the minor leagues ended up being my college and I could concentrate on the craft that I want to improve on. So um, that was my education and to get better at baseball and to learn the ropes. So I, I'll take that any day over calculus. Yeah. Hey, same here. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I did not do good in that class. I, I did not do good. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of you know, those first few years with the Royals, right? I mean, you know, you talk about, like, did you feel like – like, that must have given you so much confidence as you year, right? Getting called up and then, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, did you feel like almost like a leap in the presence from yourself from the Royals, or did you feel like a young buck still, kind of? Oh, no, I felt like a young pup because I never had a spring training with the big league club because the big league club went on strike the year before. So now I'm being called up with Michael Tucker and uh, – oh, I'll remember this name. So we uh, – Brent Cookson. We get called up three young guys and three of the veteran guys got released like Craig James, Vince Coleman. So these guys are looking at us like, who are these guys? So uh, these veterans know how to win and we're bringing in these young guys. So the manager, Bob Boone, you know, he took us in a uh, great guy, but you know, he was also being told play this guy, play that guy. So, it was tough to know when I was going to be in the lineup the first couple of years because he was a big righty, lefty, you know, all that stuff. But I hit lefties at a higher um, average than I hit righties. I hit righties with more power, but I, I mean, that's what made our Yankee team so good. I'll, we'll get to that later on, but um, I could hit left-handers, and when I get a day off against a left-hander, I'm not happy because I see the ball very well. And, you know, my confidence was um, really not there because I felt like I had to do good every game or I would not be in the lineup the next day or I would get pinch hit for. So until Tony Muser uh, took over in Kansas City, I was – on deck getting ready to hit and he said Johnny and I was like so used to Bob Boone calling me back and be, being pitch hit for I started walking back he goes I'm not taking you out you're going to play every single game every single at bat and then I played 383 straight games and my confidence was soaring and then that's when I had the um, 98, 99 and 2000 run and you know he put confidence in me um, some people didn't like Tony because he, he wanted you to hustle. He wanted you to work. And I was like, this is the perfect manager for me because this, this is what I do. This is how I play the game. And I'm a progressive and I need to have that confidence. And he had my back. And so yeah. everything started going great for me. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, those first few years seem like a pretty crazy time. I mean, real quickly before we talk about, like, um, before we get into time with the Sox, like, uh, you know, 2001, you, know, you, spent, uh, you got traded to the uh, Oakland Athletics. Um, you know, talk about, you know, your time there. I mean, because you know, Giambi and, and, you know, a movie about Moneyball and, you know, you, you know, they talk about, you know, the whole, that whole offseason story for you. I mean, take us through, I mean, that time for you. Okay. Well, I was actually in Hawaii uh, on a horseback trip. Left the phone in the car. Um, I have a cell phone then. <laughs> and then I get back and I have 30 messages and I'm listening to them all. And they said, You just got traded to Oakland. Um, give Billy Bean a call. And then, you know, I was like, Oakland, are they, are they a good team? Like, they're, you just don't hear much about them. And they made the playoffs the year before. Um, some great young talent. So when I played for Oakland, I learned how to play winning baseball. I mean, Jason Giambi taught you how to have fun on and off the field. And, you know, we, we were really good. I, I struggled the first 
half. I had a little sore wrist to start the season. I, as I was moving like a bunch of furniture because <laughs> I got traded. So, um, and those beds were heavy back then and, and I couldn't <laughs> afford movers. Um, but um, yeah, but that second half when they moved me back to, or moved me to center field because I started the season in left field because they knew I was only going to be there a year and Terrence Long was going to be there longer. So they didn't want to have him move back and forth. So we struggled um, a little bit as a team, as a pitching staff. And the pitching staff was like, put Johnny in center field. And once they put me in center field, and then we added Jermaine Dye, we went 59 and 18 in the second half. And we won 102 games. Seattle that year won 116 games, but they they didn't want to face us. And and Arizona ended up winning the World Series that year, but we, we went into Arizona and we swept them three games to nothing with our pitchers, uh, Mulder, Zito, and Hudson. And I'm not quite sure who won the Cy Young that year, but Mulder was like dominant. That was like the best pitching performance I've seen. Um, you know, I got to see Pedro and all that stuff. That was awesome when I saw it with Mark Mulder. No, absolutely. Um, you know, talk about like, you know, obviously, you know, Moneyball and and that with that, you know, the big big storyline was that 2001 offseason. I, you know, just from your perspective, take us through, you know, that transition for you, right? I mean, you know, did you always have your eyes out on Boston? Were you considering going back to the a Oakland? Um, you know, talk about that off season in particular. Oh, that off season was very tough. I mean, I have, I had two young kids that I knew I needed to get as close to the East Coast as possible. I know John Hart very well, and he was in Texas at the time. And I was like, I know you need a center fielder and a leadoff guy, and your boy A Rod really wants me there. And John goes, Man, I want you, but I don't have any money. Like A Rod has. <laughs> bunch of the money that uh, we gave him he goes I need to shift money so what he ended up doing was trading Darren Oliver to Boston for Carl Everett so Boston's pretty much the only team that needs a center fielder New York really needed a left fielder going in but Rondell White signed right away and how the Yankees work is when they talk to you they want to hear you say, I want to be a Yankee, or they just uh, move on. So they signed Rondell White. Jason Giambi thought they signed me when they said they got a left fielder. They didn't. And, you know, that was a bad move for them because guess what? Boston was pretty much the only team left. Um, and, you know what? I knew the passion and – the excitement when I signed like uh, with Boston and just the video guy, uh, Billy Broadbent, he was like, I was so happy because you were the guy I was like, you're going to help us out a lot. And, you know, no more top me, you know what, whatever you do, don't read the local papers read the USA Today because they're giving you a fair thing. Uh, don't listen to the radio. Go out and bust your ass all the time, and these fans are going to love you. I was like, it's a piece of cake. I do that anyways. So uh, went out and played well and put us in great positions to uh, make the playoffs my first year. And what stunk about that, I just told those guys going into September um, – jump on my back I'm the hot like we're going and then we get a bad scouting report on a left-handed pitcher that he never throws over to first base and so they're like get a bigger lead get a bigger lead he won't throw over well he throws over I go back to first base and my finger is sitting this way and I'm like well start walking off the field and some guy goes Johnny it's only a finger and I reached up to this guy and he's he like fainted because he saw how messed up my knuckle was and I just wasn't the same the rest of the season I came back in like a day um, 
wasn't ready and we like missed the playoffs by a couple games. But I knew if I stayed healthy, we would have made the playoffs every single year I was there. And yeah. No, absolutely. Um, you know, you know, you're you're there and then 2004, right? I mean, that season was crazy, right? I mean, take yeah. us through that season, right? I mean, just yeah. I, I still remember. I was super young at the time. I was well, six. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I was like, three. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> just like yeah, I so, remember, I remember that. Um, so take us through that. That uh, your perspective of that season. What a ride! Yeah. Well, first we had to endure 2003. Um, the loss to the Yankees, and we would have gone to the World Series and possibly won in 2003 if I didn't get ran into by Damian Jackson because I was very hot in the playoffs. I was um, doing very well, so I ended up missing the first couple games in 2003, and then I thought I would be okay to come back and play from a concussion, and nowadays they they have more studies and six weeks is what they normally think about because starting the game, I think I'm fresh because I'm not taking batting practice or running around too much. Well, I started playing the games and I'm exhausted after the first inning or two and I just have had nothing. So we endured 2003, the Aaron F and Boone shot. And then 2004, Going into the offseason, I just had the concussion, so I was so tired, so lazy, and then this came, you know, the hair started growing, the beard. The beard was always here during the offseason because I all, always went skiing, and I know I wasn't supposed to, but I was like, if I think I'm going to get hurt, I'm going to get hurt. So I, my mentality was, you know, live life to its fullest and, um, you know, worry about something when, when it happens. So... Um, this came about, um, these reporters were talking to me before the t team meeting. I was like, guys, we have our team meeting. I haven't got to see anyone. I just strolled into uh, Fort Myers and then I walk in and Theo Epstein said, you're not changing a thing. You're keeping this. And then everybody was like, who, who the heck is this guy coming in here? And, <laughs> you know, I, um, you know, went off and had a spectacular year. And, you know, it's – I'm not sure where I – you know, I got hosed in the uh, MVP that year. I think I finished, like, 18 or I, – I got hosed in the MVP race every year. I mean, I, I never should have won. You know, I should have had a couple um, top tens. But, yeah, because I had guys like Ortiz and Manny on the team, like, those guys always tend to get – um, more of the boats, uh, like tend to see um, more of the importance. But when you have to cover center field at Fenway Park and you have to, um, you know, help control the clubhouse and everything that's involved, that's what the riders really don't see about being a good teammate. Right. No, absolutely. Um, in terms of, you know, I mean, that, that 2004 year, I mean, that was crazy, right? First World Series since 1918. Um, you have two uh, home runs in game seven over St. Louis, one of which were, was a grand slam. Uh, you know, I mean, what, what was the mood around the clubhouse? I mean, with, with guys like David Ortiz, Pedro, Schilling, Nomar, Duke, Wakefield. Take us through that. Well, it was absolutely tremendous, and especially coming back from a 3-0 deficit, which never happened happen um 3-0 deficit to the Yankees which has never happened in the history of sports and Ortiz with that home run and then the bloop single that scored me in game five and Schilling and the bloody sock and then my game seven with the two home runs you know and this is I was on a Skype with Schilling and Sean Spicer yesterday and Schilling said the greatest moments that we have as athletes is when the fans are in the stands, you know, and when I silenced Yankee stadium uh, with my grand slam, that was pretty awesome, you know, and now it's nothing but silence. And, you know, it's very, you know, I commend these players uh, for going out there and um, trying to do it and play right now. But um, 
that was awesome. And then St. Louis, I mean, we, we were just hot and we just kept on rolling. And, you know, we knew after we won against the Yankees, our job wasn't done yet. You know, the curse is still there. It's still 1918 unless we beat St. Louis. So we, um, we put it all together. We kept drinking our shots of Jack Daniels and we, uh, just pull, kept pulling together as a team and we, uh, you know, swept and that was truly amazing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, what did you guys do on your free time together? New Ortiz, Schilling, and all them. I mean, did you guys ever go out as a team? Yeah, well, we normally would meet for lunch. We would drive our motorcycles um, and stop at a place for lunch. Um, a lot of times after the games, I would have people over and um, we would play cards or we would um, just hang. And sometimes late at night before a game, I would take these guys out on my boat. You know, I kept it over at the Boston Harbor and would start uh, heading up to Maine. <laughs> so, see some whales out there and then go, this is absolutely stupid. We need to <laughs> get back and got to be at the ballpark in a couple of hours. So um, I don't know. I try to live life to its fullest and uh, enjoy um, the beauties of everything. And I love the boat and the waterways and all that stuff. So I definitely had fun with my boat up there. Johnny, I, uh, I wanted to ask, after uh, game three of the 04 ALCS, you know, you guys get blown out, 19 to 8. How did you come in the clubhouse? I know, um, I think it was Millar. He was like, just need to win tomorrow. We got Martina in game seven. Who was kind of like the head in that clubhouse um, to, you know, bring the, bring the morale up and kind of believe in you guys? Yeah, well, we, we were still able to joke. We know we got our butts kicked, and we also knew that we had nothing to lose. Um, we kept joking about how we're not ready to get in the car line at school. <laughs> um, to pick our kids up, uh, and you know we're here. We came so far. Let's let's cowboy up. Let's let's rally. Let's let's play with no fear. And I mean, thank God for David Ortiz and those uh, clutch hits. And I mean the Millar walk, the Dave Roberts still, the Bill Miller. Like it was a team. You know, everybody played a huge part in us coming back from the um against the Yankees and then just keeping it rolling against St. Louis. Yeah. Yeah, you go Andrew. Uh no, I mean it was just unbelievable again. Uh I have stories of my dad saying he was, he was working on the house listening to that game 3 and he was just like, you know, after 0-3 uh where you guys lost like just a lost cause um and you know who who knows what would have happened to the team if you guys had, had lost but uh yeah, you know, you break the curse. Um, and then uh, you want to talk about moving into 05 a little bit, just kind of like how you guys felt coming into the season. Um, you got majority of the same same group coming in. Yeah, I felt really good going into 05. I know I was shooting a lot of commercials and magazine covers during the off season, And for some reason, people were worried about me not coming in ready to play. I'm like, guys, I'm not that guy. Like, this is important to me. Like I'm, I'm ready to go. And I was one of the only ones ready to go, but then we go into 2005, no Pedro, no Derek Lowe, um, Keith folks, a little bit banged up. Schilling is hurt. And, you know, we're going with some guys who had some great numbers in the national league and we're not sure if they could handle the pressure of Boston. I mean, you have to, uh, endure it and deal with it and suck it up so much that you're like, are these guys going to be ready to play? And, you know, we got David Wells, David Wells, um, big time player, uh, Matt Clement, you know, he put some good stats up in the national league. Um, you know, so it was a different feel. We changed our shortstop. I mean, Orlando Cabrera. Wow special shortstop he could do everything and I mean that was the best shortstop I've seen like play live like being able to do and granted play with Jeter and A-Rod and Nomar and 
you know, those guys are fantastic. Uh, that, uh, this guy just could do everything. Bunt, hit and run, um, take pitches, uh, steal bases, and his range on defense was like, whoa. And then we couldn't resign him because we said we didn't have any money. And then we go get Edgar Renteria, who was on the tail then on his way down. And we paid him more money. And we're going, wow, we know Edgar's great. But uh, we could have had our guy who won the World Series with us the year before. So there was a lot of – we knew we were a good, good enough team to get back to the playoffs. And, you know, we just got beat by the White Sox. You know, they got hot. We didn't. And, you know, we go home. And, you know, I felt like I was going to get – a call from Boston to resign and come back. And at that time, teams, your team can talk to, is the only one who can talk to you for six weeks after the season before you can start talking to other teams. Well, we had zero conversations with the Red Sox during the off season. And, you know, it was time to start trying to find a team to play for. And they weren't sure what was going on with the Theo Epstein situation as well. So I started looking around. I talked to Detroit. They said, we would love to have you, but we're giving this kid Curtis Granderson a shot. I talked to the Dodgers who needed a leadoff hitter, center fielder. They just signed for a call and they were like, we can't afford you. And I'm like, okay. So New York was the only team. So I started talking to New York. Um, come up with a deal. And I was like, you know what? Boston means a lot to me. The fans mean a lot to me. Let me call Boston and see if, you know, they're interested. And at the end of the day, um, they were, but mostly I think for one year. So I would have left a lot of money on the table. They knew Jacoby Ellsbury was on the way. And I mean, that's pretty much all you have to say, you know, I, I understand the business side of it. They just didn't want me to go to New York. And it's like, well, I want baseball to remain important to me. So where else can I go? And plus, if I sign with New York, I have six more weeks at home for spring training. Then I just drive back and forth. Um, I have a lot of friends on the team. Um, so it, it was a very difficult decision. I mean, I, I felt more for the fans instead of putting, you know, so I was um, crushed and, but I also knew that I had to stand up for myself and uh, move in the right direction. And, you know, a lot of people were upset, but I get it, you know, but I want, like I said, I wanted baseball to remain important and a chance to win a world series every single year. And going into 2006, going to the Yankees, I was the third Red Sox player from that championship team to go. And there were only six guys left on the Red Sox 2004 championship team that were left. So like the loyalty, there's a lot of guys here who are gone and I get it. They just have to be upfront and honest and I'm, I'm good with it. But um, I bought a house. I had that house for a number of years afterwards. So that made it very difficult too. No, absolutely. So what was, you know, what were some of the reactions from your former teammates with the Red Sox when it came to make that decision? Like Poppy and, and those guys. I mean, what were they saying? Well, they were definitely upset because their numbers are going to go down without me being on base. And, you know, they really didn't get it because they know the Red Sox have money to sign me. But, I, I mean, I, I let them know. You know, I, I was like – the Yankees have a great offer for me. I mean, it's like 12 million more dollars. And it's like, that's a lot of money. So they, they understood. They just didn't, they understand the ownership stuff. And, you know, unfortunately, nobody leaves Boston happy. You know, it, you can go John Lester to Mike Greenwell, Jim Rice, like ended up retiring. And, you know, so it's just, you know, they make it very difficult. Wade Boggs, Roger Clemens, it, 
move on. Nobody leaves Boston happy. Yeah, I, I get that, man. I mean, that must have been very tough to see about you, too. I mean, talk about those conversations with your agent, right? It was Horace at the time. Like, you know, was he – was he, you know, encouraging, you know, this move for you? You know, was, was he saying, oh, you should, I don't know, like, you know, I don't know what Boston's going to think about this. What was your friend and family? I mean, what was going on in your head? Because probably all this outside noise. Mentally, that's probably taking it on you as well. Yeah, well, it was very difficult. I, I mean, I pretty much struck the deal with Cashman and let Scott know about it. Um he wants what's best for his clients, and um, he also knew knew Jacoby was coming because he represented Jacoby as well. So that that was my best opportunity and my best chance to uh, win another World Series was to be in New York for four more years for, for for four years. So yeah, we get it. It's uh, it's it was difficult though. Yeah, Johnny, I, I totally understand that was a, a really tough decision for you. And I just want to say, like, you know, as, growing up, I knew you as a as a Yankees player. And, um, you know, but looking back on it, I I totally understand where you're coming from, especially when the Red Sox didn't even make you a real offer. Um, right. You know, it, I got it, part of the game. I mean, uh, Ellsbury did a very similar thing there where he didn't, didn't really get a big offer. Um, but, yeah, you know, you got to do what's – right for your family, what's right for you. So, I mean, I totally respect that you got your ring. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was tough for me too, man. We were When I heard the news, like, I remember my mom turned on the TV and we're like, oh, no, not Johnny, man. Not, not Johnny. <laughs> like, damn, like, he was the goat. Like, not the Yankees too. Like, that was a yeah. scare. So, um, yeah. yeah, I got an offer. I got an offer in the mail from the Red Sox days after I signed and um so they can save face you know and that that's like brutal you know and I you know and I understand the business side of baseball because the Red Sox were my third team I felt like it was going to be tougher on Ellsbury because the Red Sox was the only thing that he knew and then going to the Yankees and um, trying to live up to those expectations, uh, it's it's a little bit different, and and unfortunately, he's not well loved in both places like I am. Did you talk with Ellsbury at all? Like before he made the move, did he reach out to you and say, you know, like Johnny, you've gone through a similar situation. Here's where I'm at. Yeah, we we had a few conversations, um, and. I just told him it's the pinstripes, you know, once you put them on, they take care of you forever. Like once you uh, um, earn your stripes and win the World Series, you're you're taken care of. And I mean, that's a big source of my income now is going and hanging out with the fans at Yankee Stadium. And, you know, we're not doing that this year. So I'm um, doing my cameos at home and uh, doing that kind of stuff. And uh you know, getting ready to launch my A game product, and uh, so things are going great. And being at home with the kids, and hanging with the friends, and just enjoy life. Would you Would you say you'd make the same decision looking back on it? You know, if, you know, say it, say if um, you know, looking back on it, like say if the Red Sox were a little bit more compromising with the situation, like you know. With, would you still would you still make the same decision? You think going to New York? You happy? You sad about that? Well, I just wanted the Red Sox to show that they cared and they wanted to sign me. All they had to do was bump up their price a tiny bit, but I wasn't going to leave twelve million on the table. Um, so, um, if the numbers were the same, yeah. Uh, what I would have done different is after my time in New York, you know, I was making thirteen a year they offered me a two year, $14 million contract after I dominated in 2009. And then I was like, I'm pretty much being cut in half. Like I understand taking a pay cut. Like, why don't you cut me down to 10 and then we're both happy and we can defer money. And they're like, Nope, you got, it's either two fourteen or we're going to sign somebody else. And I'm like, Whoa. So they only gave me like five minutes to make a decision too. And I'm going, wow. 
and you're paying these guys that I'm better than a lot more money. I was like, I'm just trying to be fair. And then I wish I would have taken that two year 14 and stick with the Yankees uh, because then I go to Detroit or eight, you know, love Detroit, love the fans. Um, and then I go to Tampa, which I was planning on ending my career anyways, uh, close to home. And, mm-hmm. you know, so I was fortunate to do that, but I should have stayed with New York uh, for two more years. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you had to pick between your, your time in New York or Red Sox, I know it's tough. I mean, which of those years would you say were more memorable for you? And Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, well, they were all great, but you can't beat the time I had with the Red Sox. I mean, 2004, um, reversing the curse, 86 years, making all those people happy and even all the, um, their family members who have passed happy. You know, they, it, it's like the stories that you heard about winning for the Red Sox. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. It's, uh, Hey, Boston, Boston's always your home, man. We always got you. So Absolutely. Uh, All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, man. And then, um, you know, I, get, I, get, I know you don't have too much time now, but uh, I guess to wrap it up, uh, you know, what is it that you, you know, always would like to be remembered for, uh, you know, as a player, right? You played with so many great organizations, played at so many great ballparks, you know, one of the greatest to ever play, you know, at least for our generation. I mean, um, I mean, just talk about it, man. I mean, yeah. Yeah. What I want to be remembered for is being a great teammate. I mean, that, that goes a long ways. And whenever people see me, whenever these younger players see me, they're like, wow, um, this guy was the absolute man. And, uh, and I feel great. Like, I saw Anthony Rizzo at the uh, at a Super Bowl party, um, and he's like, he was wild from seeing me. I was wild seeing him. I was like, I love the way you play, and you know, it was awesome. Yeah, do you, do you still stay in touch with like Poppy and Pedro and and you know those guys from 2014? Get a little reunion going, maybe or? Yeah, yeah, we tend to see each other a lot at David Ortiz's uh, golf tournament. Um, not sure they're having it and also seeing my guys from the Yankees at, at Jeter's. Um, a lot of the Yankees, they live in Tampa. So I might see them at some events here and there. Um, but I'm pretty much a homebody. You know, I, I have a lot of friends here in town, um, guys who played like AJ Brzezinski, Ray Langford, Ricky Weeks, um, you know, Shaq is a couple of houses down. Um, so we have a, great group of guys here and I got a great group of golf friends here and uh, I grew up here so I I hang out with a lot of my childhood friends yeah so you hang out with Shaq too he's a few houses down you have to get a little party going or uh, yeah I, I see him every now and then like he's uh he's only here probably 10 days a year but during quarantine he was out there fishing and hanging out with his kids a lot so uh, uh yeah he's a great guy Hey, you know what? Thanks so thanks again, Johnny. Uh, yo, you're still rocking the hair, man. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I was gonna say, it. I love that you brought that back. <laughs> it's iconic, yeah. book, man. You gotta keep, you gotta keep it. Um, <laughs> but for sure, man. Um, thank you again um, for for taking the time. I know it's pretty crazy. And if there's any way we can support you uh, in any way, feel free to reach out. And again, thank you to Andy. Thank you to you. And um, yeah, man, go socks, right? All right. Cheers to you guys. Thanks, Johnny. Johnny, Take care. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.